where we'll now begin talking about a very exciting and very important class of linear transformations, symmetric transformations. By the way, symmetric is a terrible name to call these transformations, and that's why I wrote the word symmetric down here and not up there, and I'll say more on that later. But in any case, symmetric transformations are one of the most important categories of transformations in all of applied mathematics for reasons that I won't be able to summarize all at once, but that will definitely emerge over time. I will give you one glimpse, however. We will discover that under certain circumstances, the second derivative operator is a symmetric transformation. And you might say, well, what's the big deal? It's just the second derivative operator. It's probably not even as important as the first derivative. Well, it just so happens that the second derivative is the driver of life. You will notice that in Newton's famous f equals ma, a, the acceleration, is the second derivative of something, and that's very important. Also, if you think of this stick as the graph of a function, you will notice that this stick doesn't care much about its first derivative or the slope. But if I try to change its second derivative, it responds in a very dramatic way and I can really feel the restoring force. And I can probably use that restoring force to launch this piece of chalk very, very far. So it's the second derivative that, that's very often the cause of motion and therefore life. It is also not at all a coincidence that music is sound waves and sound waves are sines and cosines. And sines and cosines are eigenfunctions of this operator. So that's just one insight into why symmetric transformations are so important. So what I'm going to do next is put symmetric transformations in their proper geometric context. Until now, we have been focusing on length preserving linear transformations, which has limited us to rotations and reflections, still a very rich and intriguing family of transformations. And we discovered that when length-preserving linear transformations are represented in component space with respect to a Cartesian basis, the resulting matrices satisfy this identity. And matrices that satisfy this identity are called orthogonal. And so length-preserving linear transformations are frequently referred to simply as orthogonal transformations. And this too is a very bad name to call these transformations for three reasons. First and foremost, the word orthogonal does not in any way describe what these transformations do geometrically. What they do geometrically is preserve lengths. Is there really anything orthogonal about that? I don't think so. Orthogonal is certainly not the first word that comes to mind. Length preserving is. Reason number two is orthogonal is a bad name to call these matrices in the first place, as we discussed before. The columns of these matrices are orthonormal. So if anything, these matrices should be called orthonormal, not orthogonal. And finally, reason number three. All of this is relevant in the first place when we're analyzing our transformation with respect to a Cartesian basis. So all of this is a very special case anyway. So if we were to take a step back and look at the word orthogonal, we would have to agree that it only occasionally, and when it does, it does so very poorly, describe something related to the linear transformation. So it's not even close. It's like saying country music. So these transformations should not be called orthogonal. If anything, they should be called length preserving. So having talked about length preserving linear transformations for a long time, we're now talking about transformations that are in some sense as different as can be from length preserving transformations. We're talking about transformations that are all about changing lengths of vectors. They're about that and not much else. More precisely, we're discussing linear transformations that stretch and shrink the plane or the three-dimensional space along orthogonal directions. 
And what do we call these very special linear transformations that stretch or shrink the plane or the three-dimensional space along orthogonal directions? Well, we call them symmetric, of course. Yet another term that in no way describes what the transformation does geometrically. It would have been much more accurate to call them orthoscaling transformations. That's a very descriptive word. It's not a very pretty word, and in fact, it's not a word at all. And as we discussed before, I'm sure it won't stick, but it is very accurate in terms of describing what these transformations do geometrically. What the word symmetric does describe well is the kind of matrices that represent these linear transformations with respect to Cartesian bases. That's true. With respect to a Cartesian basis, an orthoscaling linear transformation is represented by a matrix that's symmetric. And that is, of course, why the transformation is called symmetric. So two out of the three reasons why this is bad terminology survive from the orthogonal case. Number one, it's a characterization of the matrix and not the transformation itself. And number two, it only works, it's only true when the basis is Cartesian. So it is a special case. That said, this is actually a true description of this kind of matrix. So two out of the three reasons hold. All right, so what is so special about symmetric transformations? Let's stick to the standard term. What is so special about symmetric transformations? Well, a number of things. Number one, keep in mind our overarching goal of describing complicated linear transformations in terms of simpler steps. And with respect to that goal, symmetric transformations will play a crucial role as, we still, as we'll discuss in just a second. And indeed, these transformations are very simple. It is very easy to visualize what this transformation does as a whole. One of the ways to visualize that is to try to imagine what happens to a circle. Let's consider this circle, maybe it's the unit circle, and let's talk about what happens to the circle under this linear transformation. Let's consider a specific one. Let's consider a linear transformation that stretches the plane in this direction by a factor of three halves, and in this direction by a factor of three quarters. So in fact, it shrinks the plane in this direction by three quarters. Question, what will this circle end up being as a result of this transformation? And the answer is, of course, an ellipse. An ellipse that's three halves longer and three quarters shorter. So let me try to draw it. I'll take my time because I've done a couple of takes until now and they were not successful in a number of ways, including drawing this ellipse. So this ellipse will be within these bounds. So it needs to look something like this. Okay, that's not bad. Okay, so this circle will become this ellipse. And it's easy to see that all other circles centered at the origin will become corresponding ellipses. So it's really simple to understand visually what these transformations do. They all turn circles into ellipses and spheres into ellipsoids. So they are very, very simple. Number two, of course, these numbers that I just mentioned, three halves and three quarters, are the eigenvalues of this transformation. And these special orthogonal directions are the corresponding eigenvectors. And I would just like to mention that negative scalings are allowed. So it could have been negative three halves, which of course means stretch by three halves and flip. So negative numbers are also allowed. And so you might say that, well, that's not so much more special, not much more special than any linear transformation with a full set of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Well, that's partially true because any matrix with a full set of eigenvalues and eigenvectors stretches the space or the plane along those directions by factors that correspond to the eigenvalues. The only thing that's different here is that those special directions are orthogonal. Well, it turns out that the orthogonality of these directions 
leads to magical properties. And that makes these particular transformations much more special than general transformations with a full set of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So they are indeed quite special. That's number one. And number two, if you recall the goal we just discussed of describing an arbitrarily complex linear transformation in terms of simple steps, we will show towards the end of this chapter, and this will really be one of the grandest and most fundamental theorems of linear algebra, that any linear transformation can be represented as a combination of an orthogonal or length-preserving linear transformation and a symmetric or orthoscaling linear transformation. That's really amazing because there is tremendous complexity among linear transformations. Yet any linear transformation can be represented as a length-preserving step followed by a stretching step, orthoscaling step. So any linear transformation is a rotation, possibly with reflection, followed by stretching. With the further stipulation that when it comes to the orthoscaling step, all of the factors must be positive. So all of the eigenvalues must be positive. So if there is some flipping, it all goes into the orthogonal step. So there you go. That's the theorem. And it's amazing. Let me repeat it. Any linear transformation is a rotation followed by a stretch. It can also be done in the opposite order. Any linear transformation can be considered as a combination of stretching or shrinking along orthogonal directions followed by a length-preserving transformation. And of course, there is also a corresponding step about matrices. Any matrix can be represented as a product of orthogonal and symmetric matrices. And once again, in the opposite order works as well. Any matrix whatsoever can be represented as a product of symmetric and an orthogonal matrix. Any order works, although those matrices won't commute, they will be different matrices. But any matrix can be written as orthogonal times symmetric or as symmetric times orthogonal. And let me just tell you two words on why this is such an amazing statement. Well, number one, it shows that any linear transformation whatsoever turns circles into ellipses and it turns spheres into ellipsoids. Nothing else is possible. Even though there is tremendous complexity in linear transformations, under any linear transformation, a circle becomes an ellipse, maybe a collapsed ellipse, but an ellipse nonetheless, and every sphere becomes an ellipsoid. All right, so that's from the point of view of geometric transformations. Let's think about matrices. When we do eigenvalue analysis of matrices, we discover that all sorts of things are possible. Maybe there is a full set of real eigenvalues and corresponding eigenvectors. Maybe the eigenvalues are defective, meaning that the multiplicity of the eigenvalue is greater than one, but there is not enough eigenvectors. There are not as many corresponding eigenvectors as the multiplicity of the eigenvalue. Those transformations are called defective. Sometimes we don't have real eigenvalues and we have complex eigenvalues. And sometimes we have a mixture of all of these things. Some, we have some real eigenvalues with a full set of eigenvectors corresponding to them. We could have a defective eigenvalue and a few complex eigenvalues. But even a matrix like that can be represented as a product of an orthogonal matrix and a symmetric matrix. So it's one of the most powerful and most universal theorems in linear algebra. It leads to the singular value decomposition, which I have mentioned before, and which is now considered to be one of the most, if not the most important uh, decompositions in linear algebra. So this theorem will come at the end of this chapter. What we're going to do in the next video is prove that these transformations are represented by symmetric matrices with respect to Cartesian bases. And then in the subsequent lecture, we will show that the converse is true, that any symmetric matrix represents a linear transformation with respect to a Cartesian basis that possesses these magical properties, that all it does is stretch or shrink the plane or the space along orthogonal directions.